Second goal of golden rule of data entry is to get someone else to do it. So what's important here is that by the time the sample gets to the laboratory, somebody has already entered the data, whether it's a technician on site or an engineer on site logging into his site book, or whether it is someone doing PDA logging or Excel sheet logging, or some way to have basically told you what samples they're sending you, whether it's a chain of custody sheet or a schedule sheet or whatever. They will have somehow told you what they're sending you and what they want doing to it. So if someone who's doing that could then export that data into a data format, then you would be able to import it into your branch management system and you may find that you may never need to enter the sample referencing information ever again. So if you can claim to do that, then you really have reached the holy grail of data management. And what is interesting with this philosophy is that we're not just talking about samples in a laboratory. We're talking about every aspect of your business. How many times do you type something within your business? It could be invoice numbers, it could be client details, it could be a customer's name, it could be an email address. If you apply these rules to all of that information, you will make your business more efficient. Primarily, the rule down here, log data as close to source as possible and then transfer it in an open format such as an AGS file. Okay, so AGS files might be an answer here. Let's learn a bit more about them. The AGS, the Association of Geotechnical Specialists in the UK, uh, basically analysed this problem uh, in the late 80s. Um, so we've got four people, uh, four companies here working on a particular problem. A client uh, who's using software A, a field staff using software D, and two people in between them uh, using softwares B and C. Now, how do we get data out of software D and into software B? Um, let's uh, suppose for a minute that the manufacturers of software B and the manufacturers of software D hate each other, they'll never talk to each other, they'll never share secrets, uh, and, uh, and they really don't want to be compatible or seem to be compatible with each other's program. We've reached an impasse. How do we do it? Well, the answer that the AGS came up with was let's stick something in the middle. Okay, so if we have a file format that sits in the middle, and if every application can read and write that file format, then effectively they're all going to be compatible. To get data out of the field staff and into the consultant software, he would export an AGS file, and the software B would import an AGS file. So by having this common format in the middle, we can see that there's actually all sorts of possibilities now for this data to be shared between applications. So, AGS is the holy grail of getting geotechnical software all to work together. And if you have a look on the AGS website, you'll see there's something around 30 different applications that are now AGS compatible. And that will allow you to sort of see that you can take CPD data from this program and put it into this borehole login program, or you could do lab management and put it into this borehole login program, or this national archive, or whatever. There's lots and lots that can be done using an AGS file. So what is an AGS file? Well, this is an AGS uh, 3 file, just to uh, give you a very brief introduction. Um, simply we have uh, group names, header names, and then we have effectively the data. So group name can be seen as the equivalent to a uh, spreadsheet tab. Um, so tabs along the bottom of your spreadsheet, this one would be SAMP, short for sample. Then we have header information, you see it's all separated by commas and in double quotes. We have whole ID, sample top, sample ref, sample type, sample base and sample description all in the kind of eight letter code. And these would be like columns in your spreadsheet. Then we have a units column, a units row to say uh, what the data is going to be below, what units it's going to be in. And then we have the physical data itself. So we know borehole one, there's a sample going from naught meters to one meters, it's reference this one, it's type was D and it was brown. Uh, forgive the dodgy descriptions. These AGS uh, tables, or groups as they're called, uh, effectively go into an AGS file. And they're all grouped together, or all added together. And here we can see a very simple screenshot using an AGS editor, which is uh, a free product from Kinetics, um, which allows us to see all the data together. Now, this is a very simple one. These files can get quite large, but this is really just for illustration purposes. The primary point to make here is an AGS file is simple. Now you can import that into Excel quite easily, so you don't actually need any software to start to do useful information with that data. 
Okay, so you can get going straight away and be producing SPTs with depth plots just using our beloved Excel. So if we come back to the UK business model, how does the AGS file fit into here? Well, here we can see that the client, the consultant, the site investigation company, the geotechnical laboratory and the chemical laboratory all communicate using AGS data. So the consultant gives it to the client, the consultant and the site investigation talk either in specifications or, or requests using AGS data. The site investigation company can send laboratory schedules to the laboratories and the laboratories can send those results back in AGS format. So really it's kind of the kingpin to moving data around within that UK business model we looked at earlier. And the same would be true for the Australian business model as well. Obviously you don't have so many boxes, but you're still having this information. It's important to note that the AGS file transfer can be used for internal purposes as well. So if you are the consultant who's on site doing the logs, doing the report and doing the testing, there are still ways to use the AGS within the applications and programs that you use to cut down on the amount of rekeying that you need to do. So, uh, AGS data, is it new or how long has it been around? Well, we talked earlier, the committee was effectively formed in 1989 um, and it worked for three years uh, to come up with version one. Like all good version ones, it was followed reasonably quickly by a version two, which fixed all the problems that people found in version one. Also in uh, 1994, the Hong Kong government uh, effectively mandated uh, Hong Kong AGS format, it's very similar to AGS2, uh, for all projects carried out in Hong Kong. And since this time, every site investigation work done for the government has included in the back a CD or DVD or floppy disk probably at the beginning with AGS data on it. So that's a huge archive they've built up since 1994, nearly 20 years worth of SI data. It's quite a very impressive uh, set of information they've got there. I've actually seen the archives um, and it's a very powerful resource they have. Version 3 of AGS came out in 1999 and in 2007, coming back locally um, for the RTA AGS, uh, the Road Transport Authority in uh, New South Wales came up with the RTA AGS format, which primarily was for New South Wales, but has kind of leaked out into some of the other regions as well, namely Victoria and um, Queensland. Um, I've seen RTA AGS specified in contract documents from Vic Rails, from Railcorp and from RTA. So a lot of the government bodies are now starting to specify the RTA AGS format. At the same time, New Zealand also formed a committee um, and they produced New Zealand AGS, which is published on the New Zealand Geotechnical Association website or Geotechnical Society website, um, but has never really been adopted or specified in, in New Zealand so far. 2010 version 4 came out um, in the UK and as a result uh, there's been lots of activity again around the world uh, with updating of versions. Um, the Australian Geomechanics Society uh, here in Australia has now formed a national AGS format technical committee who are looking to take version 4 and making it applicable for Australian geotechnics and also the New Zealand Geotechnical Society have formed a national committee as well who are working very quickly uh, in forming a national annex for the document to be introduced hopefully later this year or maybe early next year within New Zealand itself. So it's a fair bit of history to the AGS, lots of people have used it in lots of different uh, positions, not just in the UK, it is uh, widely used around the world including Australia and New Zealand. So uh, what does this all mean for laboratories? Uh, well there's uh, two ways to really uh, work with AGS. Uh, there's what I classify as the lose-lose adoption method. Um, unfortunately this is a reasonably common adoption method um, and one that I saw a fair bit while touring Australia in July. Um, it's seen as a painful output process. Um, it is if you haven't thought about it at the beginning to be honest. Uh, if you don't have an AGS compatible laboratory management system or you don't have a laboratory management system that can export data then you will be having a problem with AGS data. Okay, So what generally happens um, is they avoid producing it for as long as possible. So try and put the customer off that quote that we saw at the beginning of the presentation. Um, just keep saying no long enough and they'll stop asking. 
um, and then generally when they do have to produce it they will complain just how expensive it is for the client what a complete waste of time it was why they couldn't see any point in doing it and everything else and, and they'll be right they, they would have spent a lot of money producing it and what's really quite tragic with this adoption method is they'll usually deliver it late to the client two months after they delivered the technical report um, and the client will have had to have used the uh, data out of the uh, out of the report rather than use the AGS file. So it was delivered late to the client because the client requested it but also delivered late to the client so the client really couldn't use it for the purpose he wanted it for. Um, hence it's called the lose-lose adoption. Everyone loses, no one, no one wins there the client doesn't get anything and the lab has a painful and expensive process. OK, let's look at the uh, more popular adoption method, the win-win adoption. Um, so, uh, use the format internally to reduce data entry in the lab. OK, if we could get scheduling electronically from our customers, we could import all that schedule into our laboratory management system, we could print off our lab sheets, all pre-printed with the project information and all the sampling information, and we would never have to type a bit of information. No data typed into the keyboard because it all came from the client. Someone else typed our data. OK. If then our laboratory management system can produce AGS data by pressing a button at the end of the process, then it's easy. We could almost do it weekly for the client to show them an update if we wanted to. But there, what we've actually done is we've adopted AGS. We've seen it as important. We've actually used it to our advantage in the lab to get someone else to do the majority of our data entry, and we can produce it when pressing a button. And uh, this is a this is a slide I like to show with our win-win adoption team. Um, the first two there are obviously having some sort of intimate moment, and uh, they've woken the guy up at the back who uh, is having a, uh, a fine stretch by looks things. But here is a uh, a bit of a cringeable win-win adoption team working probably in the smartest lab you've ever seen. Okay, so uh, let's see a bit of AGS in action. Uh, we're going to have a look at Key Lab. Uh, it's the most used geotechnical limbs in the UK. Uh, this year we've released a new version that uh, is really geared towards the international market and specifically geared for companies that have more than one laboratory. It works in Excel. Uh, it doesn't store any data in Excel. Um, it stores it all in a SQL Server database. Um, but because it's in Excel, it's easy to extend additional tests. It's easy to put your own input routines and calculation routines in, and it's easy to customize the reports and certificates. So you're not waiting for software updates from your provider. You're not learning complicated methods to do new input screens or anything else. Importantly, it's AGS 3.1 and 4 compatible, and as of today in the presentation, we are announcing that it's RTA AGS compliant as well, uh, and we will demonstrate that in a moment. So what are we going to do in this demonstration? Well, we're going to look at a free scheduler application that you can download off our website. Again, the links to this is in the uh, information section on our, on our page that we talked about on the second slide. We're going to import some sample data, we're going to schedule some tests, we're going to import that AGS data, um, sorry, we're going to export that AGS data ready to send to the lab. Then we're going to open up Key Lab, we're going to simulate the lab receiving the AGS file. We're going to import all the sample project whole information and all of the scheduling requirements. We're going to print the laboratory sheets off, we're going to enter some test data, we're going to import some data logger data, and we're going to export some AGS data for the client. Now this is pretty ambitious uh, due to the fact that I probably only have about 10 minutes left of the presentation. So we're going to try and do all of this within 10 minutes. So let's have a go, see how we get on. <laughs> 